question that we kind of started with was what is Mormon? The people who are coming to our talks may have no idea. We never even heard of Mormon. And the first sort of answer to that is what you would find on the Mormon website. Uh, it is an invaluable treasure that will advance the university's academic mission as well as the public interest for generations to come. So it's a, it's a, it's a gift. Uh, in fact, it was <coughs> uh, the media mogul uh, John Clooney uh, who lived out there. He donated 7,379 acres of his Allen Rock County estate to the University of Virginia Foundation, which is the real estate foundation, and that included Morgan Farm. And he, he decreed as part of that gift that it should be used, it must be used, for educational and charitable pur purposes. It was a historic core of the property that was to be preserved and used for those purposes. And that's why it's considered such a gift and such a treasure for the university. And I'm going to say, I'm doing the wrong thing here. And just to give you a sense of what it, what this property looks like, here's an aerial view, um, also from the Mormon site. And this also explains that much of that land outside of the core was sold off to create an endowment, to, uh, to create endowments that would support the maintenance and programming on the property. And so what Mormon consists of today is about 3,000 acres that includes 43 buildings and core property to be held in perpetuity. So what is there is not going anywhere. It is to be uh, used for charitable and educational purposes. And I thought it'd be useful to just sort of show you where it is. It's a 25 minute drive from the university, driving out past Monticello, past James Monroe's Highland, and on your right is Morven. So it's not that far from here, um, but it is a world apart. It feels very much uh, a world apart. Here's another view of the property, and you can see some of the historic buildings on the site here, the main house, the customs claims house, the kitchen, smoke house, and other buildings. So you can see some of the historic core in this picture. It's really uh, an, a remarkable site. And one of the ways that the uh, mission of the educational mission is being fulfilled is through the Morven Summer Institute. And we'll talk more about that as we go along because that's been around for, I think, at least 10, well, at least 10 years now. Um, but it is now also the uh, sustainability lab for the university. It has a new, really uh, enhanced mission. And um, this is a picture of last summer's Morven Summer Institute classes, three classes coming together for a very special talk by Lenny Sorensen, who's a food historian. And you can see here the description of the institute that it invites students with interest in sustainability, design, food systems, and history. And it's a chance to escape the traditional confines of the classroom while working on projects with real world applications. So that sort of answers that question of what is Morven from the, hist from the university's uh, standpoint. But Lenora has another answer to that question. Well, they are, the answer is right there. It's right there. <laughs> <laughs> what is Morven? It, it's the home of my ancestors. It's my ancestral home. Three generations of, of women in my family, second, third, and fourth great grandmother were all enslaved at Morven. A uh, fourth generation, not my direct generation, but my, what is it called? My collater collateral relatives. Uh, so at least four generations born there, but three, three direct. And then several generations have had direct continuing ties to Morven. Um, through, all of, through all of the owners of Morven, through John Kluge, um, well, to, to now, because here I am. Um, Ta-da! So, so Lenora um, has been working, researching Morven long before the Mor Morven Summer Institute, long before we met, and um, I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about that research and, and how you were doing it from afar. Um, it, it took a lot of travel here. Back when I started genealogy in 1997, there was no Ancestry.com and family search to go online to, to do research. Um, I had to physically come here to Virginia to do it. So I was coming two to three times a year, meeting up with cousins, that, a couple of cousins that I had teamed up with. Um, one who had invited me to do the genealogy work with her. She was taking a genealogy class. and. Um, 
and invited me to join her, mm -hmm. which seemed weird because we lived a thousand miles apart at least. Mm -hmm. But she said she would share all of the material with me. She would copy it and mail it to me, which she did. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got started in genealogy. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that you could learn about your ancestors through old documents, mm -hmm. um, but obviously you can. Um, then uh, I was mentored here. I was introduced to Julian Burke, the president and founder, or one of the two founders of the African American Genealogy Group here in Charlottesville. And he took me under his wing and he taught me how to do, how to really do that physical research in the courthouse and in the historical society and here in special collections. Um, and it happened to be something that I'm, that I'm good at. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's where it began. But for, um, uh, it was also Julian Burke who shared with me an article of Mr. Kluge's gift to UVA. Um, but it, it, he had a life estate in the property. So it was going to be some years before I think, or at least I thought, mm -hmm. until anything was going to happen, happen there. Mm -hmm. But I accidentally, looking for something else, came across that article. Mm -hmm. That was in 2010. Mm -hmm. And that prompted a call to the university, mm -hmm. actually to someone here. At the Woodson Institute. Yeah, and ask, asking the question, mm -hmm. had the university taken possession of the property? <coughs> what I didn't know until recently is that Mr. Kluge had really just died. Mm -hmm. And I, I had no idea. But um, he, um, who, who was the person who used to be over? Deborah McDowell. Deborah McDowell, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Brain fog. Um, she was the one that put me in touch with Stort Gamut. She didn't know the answer to the question, but she put me in touch with Stort. And I asked the question, um, if had UVA taken possession of Morvan? And she said yes. Um, mm -hmm. I asked, would Morvan be researching the African-American community similar to the way Monticello or Highlands were, if Morvan was their neighbor? Um, and the answer was, we are in yes, we are interested, but we have no idea who they are. And I said, I, I do. Um, so I was, I was, she introduced me to Scott, who was doing a class, but he, he switched, you switch gears. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he did a class at Mormon researching the African American community connected to Mormon and invited me to participate with them long distance. And we collaborated, well, by email and, and by phone and, um, and got, and got quite a bit done, but there's still a lot, a lot more to do. And, and um, yeah, so it was, it was during that class, I mean, I had already known at that point for, for quite a few years of, well, at least maybe 10 years, mm -hmm. about my, that I had a connection to Morvan, but it was during, so I was aware of my second and third great grandmothers, but it was during that class um, that I discovered uh, a document that contained the name of my fourth great grandmother, and it was the continued research that I was able to identify, prove that it was her in the documentation. So mm -hmm. I suspected it was my fourth great grandmother. She was the only person on a inventory mm -hmm. uh, of a person that had two names. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was thought with the two names that they were a, like a double first name. Mm -hmm. but, it, but it wasn't. I recognized that, last, that to be a last name in the family. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be right. Yeah. yeah. Big discovery, and, and we'll talk more about where that led later, uh, mm -hmm. because Lenora, over time, really dug in. But we'll get to that, because we, we want to kind of bring you in and sort of talk about how this, this class that we're teaching sort of originated in that first small seminar, history seminar, mm -hmm. and uh, really, one of the reasons um, I was interested was that back in 2010, remember, and you, your timeline is great because it, you saw 2001, the gift is made in 2001, Kluge doesn't die until 2010, but sometime around 2010, uh, the university takes possession and Stuart Gamage, who was the director of Morvan at the time, um, or Morvan programs, I'm not sure of her exact title, but she was the person who was in charge of of leading this effort to use Morvan as, a histor as an educational site. And she reached out to uh, <coughs> professors here who might be interested in studying Morvan from a variety of perspectives. And um, I don't remember all the details of that, but we, we had a number of faculty uh, who 
really wanted to be part of that. And I, this is an old website that I created back then, which is no longer online, but I saved a little uh, screenshot of it. I was teaching HIUS 4933 Morven Farm, the Rural Virginia Landscape and History and Memory, and I think that's the one where I had turned it toward Morven. But I, had, I must have had a connection to Morven already to have, well, something was going on already in the mix, and you, you sort of, by great- Showed up at the right time. We just sort of found each other at that perfect moment. But I wanted to point out there were other classes being taught then, Hank Sugar, and Manuel Lerdo were teaching an uh, environmental science course called Accelerating Landscape Secession in Virginia Piedmont Forest. Uh, Christina Hill uh, was teaching a landscape uh, architecture class, uh, a graduate studi studio on rural landscape functions and the design of perform and performance improvements. <coughs> and Bill Sherman, uh, also in the architecture school, was teaching a graduate architecture design studio on adapting the built environment for sustainability. And we created something really remarkable. We all agreed to teach our courses basically at the same time and devote a portion of the class to come together each, I believe it was every week. And uh, it was at the architecture school. And for the faculty, it was so mind-blowing to see how they were interpreting the same landscape, all these different perspectives on the same landscape. And the, the, the organizing principle was something called ecosystem services, which is there are, uh, the, the land has value. Um, and that value can be in you know, carbon sequestration or it can be in the cultural value attached to the land. And, and we each had to sort of find out what, what's the value that you are looking to document and, and foreground. And so that was really fabulous experience as a, uh, both as a faculty member but also this experience in the classroom, it was a small seminar with history majors primarily, and Lenora and I never met. Face we didn't have Zoom. I don't even know how we really did it, honestly. <laughs> uh, we didn't have Zoom at the time, but we were very, very engaged in exchanging information and resources. She had amazing databases of her family, and we had access to records here in Albemarle County that could be added to her growing set of information about her family members. And we worked together, we, uh, we, our students produced projects. And this is a, one project was by Kate Wellens, and she was looking into Reverend Lee Jones, who is your? Second great grand uncle. Second great grand uncle. And um, this is important because he was somebody who continued to have an association with Morvan after slavery. He continued to work there. He had a, a personal relationship with the, uh, the sons of uh, Smith. Daniel Smith. Daniel Smith. And uh, Kate put together a sort of a biography that um, connected his story to Morvan. And um, that was her contribution. We had a couple students. Uh, this was actually, uh, this as a separate class, a second class that we did. Uh, two students from the architecture school, this was, uh, looked at David Higginbotham. David Higginbotham was the plantation owner who bought the property and converted it into a really full-scale slave labor uh, plantation. And they went through his um, journal and account books and wrote up a report. So we were beginning to dig into the primary sources. The students were taking on very specific research projects and um, presenting them at Morven. We would have a final showcase at Morven. Um, and, and we also were giving papers, and there were a number of scholars at that time who were also interested in researching Morven, and uh, this led to a number of scholarly presentations. This is a panel that was at looking at uh, Morven before it was Morven. It was called Indian Camp. It was managed by Thomas Jefferson on behalf of his uh, adoptive, adoptive son, son, William Short. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I and others were very interested in that era, the Short era, uh, because it was experiments in uh, tenant, farming? tenant farming. And Short was pushing Jefferson to experiment with a transition to free labor. And that correspondence was something I was very interested in documenting and did produce a project around. So there's the class work, there was, independent, there was scholarly work, we were presenting at conferences, um, 
And um, <coughs> that was very exciting. But one of the things that happened around that time was I left the University of Virginia and moved to Florida and uh, began a new position there. And that made it difficult for us to continue this kind of really intensive partnership around that. But I just want to show you that we didn't stop working together and the research didn't stop. It was just this really intensive on-site work that I was able to do here was difficult. Neither of us were here. Um, but we continued to produce and we came to the 2017 uh, Connecting with Community. Uh, it was the University Slavery Public Memory and Built Landscape Conference. That was the first time Lenora came to Morbid. You had been to Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. But I had driven past more than many times. The gate was always locked. And so we went up there together. This was the first time I met Lenora face to face was at this conference in 2017. We went up there and oh wow, that was wow. Just that experience for you, I know, for me being with you to be standing in those places that you had been studying from afar and well, it was it was very special to be able to walk in the place where my ancestors lived and where they walked. And I, one of the pictures that we use on our, on our poster is from that, you standing on the, what is called the Claims, the Claims House, House steps. And that still, in a way, is that moment for me, that electric moment of, well, of, of well, that connecting. Spot, that spot on the Claims House steps is where my family was sold from when David Higginbottom died. So we reconnected. We had never completely lost contact, but I think that the research partnership in a way was we could not really pursue that. I think this was a chance to revive that. And we, we um, I was working on the Jefferson correspondence with William Short, uh, created a digital project, published about the, the project in current research and digital history. And um, then we get to this new sort of reborn Morbin Summer Institute course. And I'm going to turn this to you to discuss how that came to be because it was really you who initiated this. Well, that's true. I had, I had been wanting to initiate it ever since it stopped. Well, my, my research never stopped. But um, I came across an article on Morbin where the um, <coughs> history of African Americans there had kind of been overlooked. It jumped from William Short to, I don't know, someone much more current. In the 20th century, yeah. somewhere in yes. the 20th yes. century. Yes, and I, I reached out to Rebecca. I found out that she was the acting director at Morvin, and she um, very graciously agreed to meet with me out at Morvin, and, and we talked about my thoughts on continuing or reviving this class and uh, arranged for a meeting with Lewis Nelson, and between the two of them um, made it happen. And, and I asked specifically that they al it be allowed that, that Scott continue the work that he had already begun. Um, well, I don't think there was anybody better to do it. You, you, are, you knew it, you were familiar with it, you had the expertise in it, it, it had to be you. And, and for me, it was so exciting to hear that this was even a possibility. I don't think. And I, don't, I could not believe that, that, that this was something that could really be made to happen. And in, since it was a summer course, I, I thought, well, why not? The, you know, mm -hmm. I can certainly come up for four weeks. And at that time, we were talking about a four-week course. And we did teach a four-week course last year. And um, we began to just imagine it. What would it be? What would we do? How would we organize this course as part of the Morvan Summer Institute curriculum? There are two uh, already two very popular courses being taught. Uh, Paul Friedman is here in the room teaching politics of food, and Phoebe Chrisman teaching. I, her title is it has sustain, sustainability. Sustainable, sustainable communities, and we were adding our course to that mix, and and. That was exciting too, that we would be up there at the same time, at least for two weeks, as those other two courses. We could come together for some special events at lunch, and we began to uh, organize the course. We also began to do more research. We wanted to make sure that when the class started, we knew what the students were going to be researching, what collections we would want them to go into. This is going to be a hands-on research course. This is what we love, is discovering history through these documents. So we uh, went to special collections. And uh, this is uh, 
Uh, also, we reached out to uh, Robert Vinson, the new Lou director of the Woodson Institute, and Lisa Schutt, who is here in the room, and said, please come meet with us, and we want to share with you what we're doing, and we very much want this to be tied in with the Institute, that this is going to be uh, an African American and African Studies course, um, but it's also going to be cross-listed in architecture, and it's going to welcome students from history, American Studies, any field, but we definitely wanted the Woodson Institute to be uh, a home to the class and in fact they are the Woodson Institute is sponsoring this event we wanted to have this event in the Woodson Institute here at Minor Hall um, for the same reason that we very much consider this a, a, a Woodson Institute um, and more of a partnership so here we are at Special Collections. We also went to the Virginia Museum of History and Culture we were working under these really constrained research conditions because of COVID you have two hours get everything you need and leave. Get out. <laughs> get out. And so I have pictures of, we were going click, 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 and we're quickly going through these things and finding materials. We also visited the Library of Virginia and we went to the Civil, American Civil War Museum. Mm -hmm. um, and do you want to say a word about Anna and oh, why well, we were reaching out to? Well, Anna, Anna Edwards, is, she works in education and she's a, um, a public historian. Um, she graduated with her master's degree from Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, Anna is an, a strong advocate for the African burial ground in Shackle Bottom, um, which is the first African burying ground in, um, in Richmond. Mm -hmm. And uh, Anna, Anna is one of the people who have been advocating with me for <coughs> what is the second African burying ground, the Shackle Hill African burying ground. Which was a um, which opened in 1816. It was a municipal burial ground in this, opened by the city of Richmond, and it was literally erased from the landscape, the phys, the vis, visual landscape. It's still there, and it's it's been damaged many times, but it's it's still there. It was the largest burial ground for free people of color and the enslaved in the United States. Mm -hmm. It expanded from two acres to over 31 acres, and over 22,000 people of African descent were buried there. But it was, it was made to disappear. If you've driven from here to Richmond, any of you, you've driven right over it. Um, the Highway 64 runs right through it. Um, so yeah, you don't see it, but it's, but it's there. Um, that burial ground, um, in, when we finished our work, or when our work had to stop in 2011, was it? Mm -hmm. When our work had to stop, I was left with a bit of a cliffhanger. Um, I, I knew my uh, family had been sold on the Claims House steps at Morven after the death of Dave, David Higginbottom. Um, it's my, but my second great-grandmother and her children had been purchased by the new owner of Morven. Um, what some of the information revealed was that my fourth great grandmother, um, that the um, widow of David Hickenbottom had intended on keeping her. I didn't know if she had, uh, just that the intention was mentioned. And because um, as far as I knew, my family connections were always here. But it turns out that, well, I waited for all that time until we were invited to the symposium yeah, or until until you told me about this symposium in 2017 on slavery mm -hmm. and that finally gave me the opportunity to look in richmond to see if she wound up there because that's where mrs higginbottom wound up and i thank steve thompson the archaeologist just very much because he was the one that told me mrs higginbottom went there mm -hmm. uh, but i had no idea if um, my fourth great grandmother had gone uh, so the symposium gave me the opportunity to get to Richmond in order to do the physical research. It wasn't something that could be done online. And so I did three day trips to Richmond um, before the start, came in a few days early mm -hmm. before the symposium. And on my third trip, a letter caught my eye. Mm -hmm. And it was a letter written, about, written on the day my fourth great grandmother died. It was written about her death. and. Um, it was a very sad letter that brought tears to my eyes, but um, it let me know that yes, she was there. And so I inquired as to where she might have been buried. Mm -hmm. 
and I, I was given a list of probably every black cemetery in Richmond, but quickly did the research to, to weed out which ones it could and could not be. And there was, there was really only one answer. Uh, the burial ground at Fifth and Hospital Street connected to the Shaco Hill Cemetery uh, was the burial ground for, for slaves that existed during that time. She died in 1857, April 25th, 1857. Um, so uh, they gave me the address, or as the well, corner, northeast corner of Hospital Street and Fifth Street, and I traveled there, and I couldn't, I couldn't recognize it. I was very confused by what I, by what I saw, and it took me a couple of months to figure out that I was actually in the right place, but um, it was the right place. Um, very sad. And so you've established then that Morvin is connected to this burial ground in Richmond through Lenora's fourth great grandmother. grandmother. And but, so when we so were designing the class, we wanted to make sure that we went there, that we took the students there. And this was part of the thinking about what are we going, when we bring them there, what, what are we going to do? One thing we knew was we were going to go to the American Civil War Museum because part of the history of this is the history of the enslaved population during the Civil War but also to work with Anna Edwards, if we mm -hmm. could uh, uh, yeah. get a, a special tour from her. Uh, we were thinking about programming for the class, mm -hmm. but we also were able to do something very special during that yeah. trip, thanks to but, you. Thank you. But also UVA has a direct connection to that burial ground as well, mm -hmm. dating back to at least 1832. I mean, there's documented proof that will take it to 1832. It could have been earlier, but um, the medical college. A medical college for UVA, they routinely rob the burial ground of its dead uh, for, for the training of, of the medical students. That, that burial ground was, its main, was one of the main targets. And that was a presentation at the conference in 2017. Yes. I think it was the first presentation that you attended. Yes, it was, it was, the, opening, it was the opening event. That was, that was, oh, that wasn't nice. Right. Um, I had just, for me, because mm -hmm. I had just, I had just learned that my fourth great grandmother spent her last few years of life in Richmond. I just learned that she had died there and I just learned where she would have been buried. And then at the opening event at the conference, I learned about the grave robbing by the medical college. So I learned where she was and then I learned that her grave may have been robbed. That was not a good feeling. Mm -hmm. That was horrifying. But I mean, I don't know that it was Rob, but that it, it is a possibility. Well, one of the things that we, we certainly wanted them to, um, to visit the site and to have you talk about that history, but also to see the other cemeteries nearby and see how uh, <coughs> the difference, the, the striking difference in commemoration and the protection and preservation of cemeteries around that, that site. Um. That was night and day. I went to the Hollywood Cemetery the day before mm -hmm. I went to the Shaco Hill African Burying Ground, or what mm -hmm. we are now calling the Shaco Hill African Burying Ground. Mm -hmm. uh, the Hollywood Cemetery is a very beautiful place. It's where the Higginbotham's are buried. So we had the Higginbotham burial site at Hollywood, and we had uh, Kitty Carey's burial site at the Shaco Bottom. Shaco uh, Hill. Shaco, excuse me, that's a very bad mistake. Shaco Hill, there is another, there's another cemetery and another project on Shaco Hill African Burying Ground and our students we wanted to sort of bring them to that site to experience this and learn about it but also thanks to you there was going to be a very special capstone event maybe we'll hold off on that we'll we'll we, we'll get to that when we talk about the class because it was really we we designed thanks to Lenore we were able to design a really special capstone event and we'll talk more about what happened on the day that we went to visit thanks to you so we'll get there we, we'll tell you about everything leading up to this very special trip that we made to Richmond and then share with you the experience of the students and Lenora uh, talking about that moment of going to Richmond. So, uh, so we'll pause a minute, and if you don't mind pausing that for a second, just to say we, bring this, we brought the students in on day one and this is also a little bit of a preview for those of you who are interested in taking the class. On day one, we all sort of come together and have an orientation. We, we, we introduce the faculty, we take a tour of the site and get to know each other and um, 
And so that is, this is the barn called the barn. Uh, and where the meeting we, barn. The meeting barn. Yes, there are barns and then there's the meeting barn. Um, so you can see sort of a sense of how many students are there. Um, and this is the, the tour. And one of the first things we did was we asked students to, to we didn't, we, we asked them, uh, what was your impression of the site? Um, and then uh, to write about that. Uh, what, what, was, what, what did you, what were, we had them write words on, on paper. Um, and it was really uh, a moving experience to see, t talking about the beauty of the site. And then at the same time, to begin to understand the, uh, the suffering and the, 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 the side of the site that was hidden from, site, from view. Um, and uh, these, what we're doing here is just sort of using some excerpts from the journal entries. This was a first year architecture student. Uh, the first impression was a sense of awe at the vastness and beauty of the space. And as I began to delve into Morvan's history, I started to understand the many layers of human life that occurred there, that occurred there from the days of the Monacan tribes to the early settlers to plantation era owners, slavers, and enslaved peoples to present day descendants and UVA's stewardship. So this, this multi-layered landscape, even on day one, they're beginning to sort of come into an understanding of that. Um, as we got into our part of the course, so we sort of separate into our classes, and uh, we would invite uh, people who had been studying Morvan, who had some expertise, and introduce students to how, how we can approach the question of this history. What kinds of methodologies can we use to get at these layers of history? And we asked uh, Nick uh, Von Harper, who was part of Ravana Associates and had been involved in some of the digs from 2010, uh, to come in and, and sort of take, tell us about the research that was done, the findings, and to take us out and walk a bit around and explain uh, what the findings were and, and allow the students to ask questions. And some of this involves new technology. So we are introducing students to, to, to new technologies and thinking about really sensitive issues about how to deal with grave, with burial sites, things like that, which are obviously a, of great importance and of, of concern on any historic landscape. This was a very exciting moment when we went to the archives and began to look at the Higginbotham and Smith papers. And um, we were able to sort of work as a group and we had not read through every single letter. And so the students are reading through, we are, we are documenting these images with our camera and then we're going to sort, we're going to put them into a an app called fromthepage.com, which is a crowdsourcing transcription app, so that we, we could then look at them more closely and transcribe the handwritten text. But they were reading them on site and trying to identify um, letters that might contain really uh, valuable insight into the experiences of the enslaved people. And um, it was remarkable, not only because we, we did find so many letters that gave us that kind of evidence, but also just the, the, the nature of this collection, the, 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 how, the, 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 the odds and ends, the ephemera that was included in this locks of hair. There was a lock of hair <laughs> from <laughs> I'm Summerfield sorry, Smith. I touched it. It was... <laughs> <laughs> Who actually, it was, it was silky soft. It was weird, but I knew they had cut it from him after he had passed away. But imagine yourself, a, you know, if you've never been in an archive, and, and this is the point, was um, a, this is a third year history major. My first reaction to everything was, wow, I'm actually touching and studying documents from the 19th century that I can study. I've seen letters that, from that time at sites in Charlottesville like Monticello, but it was, this was the first time using the documents for a class and not through a glass shield. And, um, and the other comment that the tactility of the artifacts we were examining, the feeling of the paper, the weight of the journals, the drawings, photographs, locks of hair and plant cuttings made me feel connected to and privileged to be able to do so. And the students said this, they felt privileged to be able to touch this material in this way. I mentioned that we did transcription. We were able to sort of work with documents that were also available online through the Library of Congress and other sites. And uh, so we would take the, the called the slave schedules, that's exactly, that's what they are called, and the agricultural census data and began to extract that data so that we could begin to uh, look at the numbers. Who, you know, what, what can we learn about who lived there from the slave schedules, uh, which include ages and, uh, you know, we wanted to know who, who, how many people are working here, what are their ages, what kind of, 
uh, agricultural labor is being conducted on site. And, and putting that together with the, the letters and other sources, we can begin to get a picture. Uh, and this is the <coughs> software we use, transcribing the handwritten letters. And the students talked about this. They thought this, this was fun. We would read letters together and try to transcribe them together. Because for some students, they had never done this. And reading 19th century handwriting can be a real challenge. And uh, here's a fourth year uh, African American studies major. It was so fun reading those documents as a class together. I thought that was really engaging and a nice way to get hands on with the class material. It was also kind of funny because even though everyone in the class was puzzling through difficult 19th century cursive together, there still were some words that were just impossible. <laughs> and that is true. Um, and students who thought, there was a student who just said, I cannot make any sense of this. And she just kept working at it. And by the end, she had really kind of cracked the code. And she was really, really good at it. Um, and it was really fun to see that sense of, of um, we can do this. I, I, you know, this is not a foreign language. It's, it's like learning to read the particular handwriting. Here's uh, the 19, 1860 agricultural census. Uh, the students talking about uh, the information that can be gleaned from that census. And uh, our, archi our architectural, uh, the landscape architect graduate student designed this beautiful graphic to sort of convey the information. 70 swine, 52 sheep, 38 cattle, I can't read everything. Other cattle. Horses, 11 horses, 10 working cows, 7 asses and mules, milk cows. This is the kind of information. And the students, of course, are learning what, what, is, what kind of information is held in there and how can we use that to make sense of the labor and the work of the people, the enslaved population you know, of Mormon. Um, we also had other guest speakers. Lenny Sorensen, who is just a wonderful uh, historian, PhD, William and Mary PhD, who is a uh, food historian and a, a really a star. She was on, um, what's the name of the? This? High, on the High on the Hog. Yes, we had the students watch that episode with Lenny. Uh, and uh, then Lenny came and spoke. And thank you, Paul, for arranging that, because um, the students got to try corn pone. Uh, Lenny gave a lecture. And, we, and then we invited Lenny to come back. And she gave us a private tour or special, her interpretation of the kitchen at Morven. The, the structure, it's been much remodeled, but it is the historic kitchen. And so that was very special for all of us. And we, we recorded her uh, talking about that. And here you can see that the students are responding. And I, I want to give you the student reaction, just so it's not just us pitching this. I want you to see that the students were it, responding in their journals. Learning about enslaved cooks makes me feel like I'm connecting with my roots. Uh, slavery forced slaves to come up with unique traditions and techniques, which is a big part of the cuisine, culture, and history behind enslaved cooking. And, uh, and just you know, this ability to taste, right? It's another one of those tactile things that you're eating uh, corn pone with molasses and honey. And uh, the student is comp comparing it to cornbread, only three ingredients, salt, water, and cornmeal. So that was another very rich shared experience. And this is where we're coming. I mean, now we're getting to the payoff here. Lenora very, had been working so hard. Tell us about what you were trying to accomplish on site at that time and, and what we were able to do during the class. It was the, the marker well, ceremony is really what I'm getting at here. Well, the, the burial ground, the Shakuhila African burying ground is you know, very much endangered. I mean, it always has been but it's endangered by the DC to RVA high-speed rail project, which wants to lay track through, more track through it. There's already track through it. That's what it looks um, like, by the way. There's, that's an abandoned gas station. There was a shell, uh, um, not shell. I don't know, I can't remember which station it is, but there was a, there was a gas station constructed on it. Um, the billboard is constructed on it. Um, the Hebrew Cemetery, is con that part of it is constructed on it. Um, the, the street is constructed on it and the viaduct. Um, so thir 31 acres of land has been repeatedly desecrated and damaged, but it's still a burial ground. There are still people buried there and, and they've had some archeology span done on, on this ground recently that, that proves it. There's, there are still people there. There's still lots of people there uh, all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, but I have been well advocating for it, fighting, fighting for its protection, fighting for its recogni recognition. It's, it was erased from the map 
Last time it appears was 1905, mm -hmm. and then it's gone. So people who lived in the area didn't know it was there anymore. Well, so much had happened to it. I guess you know, painful things. You may not pass that pass that down to yeah. the next generation. People didn't know for the most part it was there. So, few historians, yeah. but most people no idea. So yet yeah, I've been fighting for its recognition. And you were and able its protection. to secure a historic marker for the site. Yeah, that and we wrote um, with Steve, archaeologist Steve Thompson, uh, archaeologist Dan Maurer, and um, a VCU history professor Ryan K. Smith. Uh, and initially we had the help of also archaeologist Ellen Chapman. She helped us with the preliminary information form, mm -hmm. but we had to write a National Register of Historic Places nomination to try to get the burial ground on the National Register. Which happened soon after this, right? That, or was it before this? Well, it, it'll, you'll, yeah, you'll get it. We'll see. You'll get we'll see. But I just wanted to, give, to say that Lenora scheduled the historic marker unveiling for the class so that we were able to be there for a very big public event with city officials and uh, 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 the mayor spoke. And, and Lenora spoke, and it was a very moving experience and, and a lot of coverage there. And there, there's our group there, a, a group picture. But I want to show you uh, something that came out during our class, which was CBS Sunday Mornings. You had to slip away one day for an interview, right? Yeah, about 20 minutes before okay. class was over. I'm going to see, uh, I'm going to play this for you. In honor of Juneteenth this Sunday, we continue to highlight grassroots efforts to reclaim African American burial grounds. We've been following our friend and former producer, Howard University's own Rodney Hawkins and his family and their efforts to recover their ancestral cemetery in East Texas. Well, the family recently returned for an annual cleanup. And this morning, Hawkins introduces us to a woman trying to get recognition for one of the largest African American burial grounds in the country. From the stately buildings to the centuries-old cemeteries, history is on full display in Richmond, Virginia, except here. Beneath this highway, under this abandoned gas station and overgrown lawn, is one of the largest African-American cemeteries in the country, Shaco Hill African Burying Ground. But you couldn't tell. These people have been forgotten. They've been made invisible and they're being treated as, as if they never existed at all. Lenora McQueen is a genealogist who traced her great, 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 great grandmother's grave to this site. No marble tells where Kitty Carey sleeps, only a simple slab of painted pine. Using documents like this poem from 1866. For Kitty Carey lived and died a slave. Over 22,000 free and enslaved African Americans were buried here starting in 1816. This graveyard expanded to 31 acres. When you drive past, 22,000 people are buried here. When they drive down this street, they're driving over it. They re-extend the street in about 1883. And bones and bodies, it's in the city council records, bones and bodies are used as fill in the street and left sticking out of the ground. That has to hurt. It does, very much. It's appalling. It took you years to find your ancestor and to end that search with this. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. It was horribly gut-wrenching. Um, if I didn't laugh about it, I would cry. Next to the African burial ground sit two nationally registered cemeteries for the Jewish and white communities, officially marked and well-maintained. It's a stark contrast. This isn't by accident. The white authorities during Jim Crow segregation didn't have any interest in African-American graves. McQueen turned to Ryan Smith, history professor and author, for help. There was also an effort to build up the history of the Confederacy. Just as the bridge behind us was being built in the late 1880s, the foundations for the Robert E. Lee Monument were being set. How do we use history to change a nation? to make us better. Lonnie Bunch is secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Why are African-American burial grounds so important, not just to African-Americans, but to American history? You can tell a great deal about a nation by what it remembers, by what it celebrates in its museums, by what it builds monuments to, and often what is neglected is African-American and especially African-American cemeteries. He is pushing for legislation to create a national registry 
for African American burial grounds. I think this register could make connections, could make, could allow people to know their history better and to honor that history by remembering. <laughs> I know the power of these connections firsthand. One year ago, our efforts to restore my family cemetery allowed researchers to identify my enslaved great-great-great-grandfather. Despite this being a document that shows my ancestor as an asset, it still documents that he existed. You realize that you are not isolated. You're from tradition, families, and that should give you inspiration as you live your own life. For most of her life, she was enslaved on the Morven plantation. Inspired by her ancestor, McQueen has been pushing for years to get recognition for the Shaco Hill African burying ground, starting with a historic marker. The graveyard has been added to the state landmarks register. How does it feel to come this far? It's kind of bittersweet because I know there's still a long way to go. This place is still very much threatened. The National Register is next on her list. Her goal is to honor her ancestor and others buried here so they may truly rest in peace. What do you think your ancestor would say to you? It's about time. For CBS Mornings, Rodney Hawkins, <laughs> Richmond, Virginia. It's about time. What took you so long? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I commend her for her efforts. Oh, absolutely. I was having a conversation about this very thing, priorities. Yep. And where do you place your priorities in terms of who you honor and who you respect? And this is a brilliant example of it. If our history isn't preserved properly, it can fade into obscurity. Absolutely. And this is a case where she has done her job to help yeah. preserve our history. Tell your story. That's Tell right. Tell your story. <laughs> You can imagine how the students felt seeing their professor. <laughs> we come to class, I said, I want to share it with you. Something that was on the news this morning. Um, and they do say, they talk about this. I mean, they, they let's see if I can get this back to, oh, I know there's more. Um, I might have to do this manually. Um, oh, that's interesting. There we go, okay. Uh, almost to a, a person, every student reflected on how powerful it was to be part of this moment in Richmond, but also to, to, they were so inspired by Lenora's advocacy and the personal commitment and the academic rigor that she brings to this. And that was such a lesson to everyone. And you can see some of the quotes here. I won't, I won't read them except to say they all say this is so moving for them and uh, the research, the tenacity, dedication, and strength, as well as the emotional investment involved in the process of discovering one's story. And that is the power of this, I think this collaboration and for the students to be working with, with Lenore, who's not just researching Morgan, but really working at the state level <coughs> and the national level to preserve and document these sites. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you did get a historic, the, get the site listed. Yes, we, we learned that um, very quietly that it was approved um, probably just two or three days after this aired. Yeah. And so, and one of the things the students do, I told you they do journals. This is an example of an architecture student's journal. It can be in any form and we're going to use more, uh, we're going to probably introduce other forms of, of storytelling and uh, video blogs and things like that this year. So to sort of expand the, the different kinds of media that you can use to sort of record your uh, experience. Um, and just to say that while we were there, we visited the museum, we did go to Hollywood Cemetery, and all of that was very helpful for the students thinking about if they were building an exhibit, you know, what goes into building an exhibit? Uh, we were studying Civil War era letters. Here they were at the museum seeing how letters are presented and interpreted. So that was really valuable. Um, our goals this year is to do more sp site specific research. We really are interested in um, interpreting specific structures on the property, uh, the fields, <coughs> the, 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 the main house, of course, and the kitchens and the his claims and custom house, but also the fields and the barns and, and, and sites that are associated with individuals like Lee Jones Creek. You men we mentioned Lee Jones earlier. Lee Jones Creek is a great place to tell uh, a story, his story, but also a story that extends after the period of enslavement into the, the post-emancipation era and the development of descendant communities around that area. So that's our strategy. Uh, this is 
some of the materials that we're going to be using in the class, consulting uh, historic records, photographs, um, and that'll be, a, we'll probably, the, un, the feeling is that we'll create teams of students to work on these projects and to think through how best to tell those stories. Um, I'm, this, I'm just to show you that this work is going to be applied because these are the old pamphlets that are outdated. Uh, this is from 2011 and they were very great man focused, very much about architecture um, and timelines of estate ownership and management. Really very little attention to the people who lived and labored on these plantations. Um, and I won't go into all this, but you can sort of <coughs> really critique these. But I think we want to show the students that um, this is what had been the interpretive frame for so many years. And you have a chance as students to help fix this, to, to create a much more inclusive history. Thank you. Thank you.